Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. This is a podcast dedicated to you, helping business owners actually run and operate successful accounting, bookkeeping, and tax businesses so that you can get paid what you're worth. Now, in this process, we actually have each and every week episodes dedicated to address the various issues that we face running these accounting firms, such as marketing, selling, onboarding clients, retaining clients, offering quality services, and so much more. Today, we have an amazing guest. It's Dominique Molina. Now, she happens to be someone that I've been looking forward to having on the show for some time because she is the founder and president of the American Institute of Certified Tax Planners. She is a best-selling author and a frequent television guest and media expert on tax issues. She has previously been named as one of the top 40 under 40 most influential accounting professionals by CPA uh, Practice Advisory Magazine. However, she was not going to reveal to us today that she's under 40. So that's one of the things that we want to point out there. But please welcome Dominique Molina. Dominique, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me, Roger. Yes, yes. So one of the things that I was looking forward to discussing is this evolution to basically the institute that you have today. So I want to go backwards in time mm-hmm. and first of all, just kind of find out what drew you to accounting and tax. Give us a little bit of a history as to your background there. Oh, you know what? I love the puzzle. And I've been ba- I've actually been balancing my parents' checkbooks since I was eight years old. Okay. And I love putting the right numbers in the right boxes. And uh, and so I did my very first tax return for myself when I was 15 years oh old. My. And uh, I loved it. I just thought it was the greatest puzzle. And at the end of the day, you know, you end up with this giant reward, which is money back. And to a 15-year-old, you know, even getting $127 back is a big deal. So, <laughs> so that's kind of how I was drawn in. And... Uh, just a fun fact is it wasn't until many, many years later that I actually discovered I'm from a very long line of accountants. I just didn't know it before I got in this business. Oh, really? so I think it's kind of ironic that I went took this path. So it's the nature versus nurture argument that's coming into play here then. Were you actually inclined to do this or was it the environment that caused you to be an, an accounting tax professional? Um, so with that being said, did you first out of, you know, maybe in your career start off in the accounting profession or what was your journey there? Yeah, I, I started out like most CPAs uh, working for one of the big firms okay. um, and working with big businesses so that I could meet my experience and my licensing requirements. And when it was time, I started my own tax practice serving businesses in Southern California. Mm-hmm. and. In that experience, obviously, you're doing the tax. What brought you to want to create the American Institute of Certified Tax Planners? Well, you know, I I quickly realized the huge difference in the tax amounts that were being paid by everyday small businesses. Mm -hmm. And as I built my practice, dozens and dozens of new clients all seemed to be missing out on tax deductions that they were entitled to. And they had all paid sizable amounts of money to the IRS. It's money that could have been kept in their own pockets or put to use in their businesses. And so I was really stunned. And I I felt like blinders had been taken off my eyes. And I was kind of seeing a world that I never imagined could exist, a world where every small business owner I met with was getting the short end Mm -hmm. of the stick. Um, They simply weren't getting the benefits that I'd seen their big business counterparts get, uh, even though they deserved it. And uh, and so eventually, when others started hearing of the amount of taxes that my clients were saving, my waiting list grew to be two years long. Um, And the the shocking thing is, at that time, on average, I was finding about an extra $25,000 that people were paying in tax every year that they just didn't have to, all because they just didn't know. You know, what you're bringing up here, I find are two very important points that tax preparers need to be aware of. And I'm gonna introduce it as, first of all, the difference between tax planning and tax preparation. And then the Mm -hmm. other thing I'd like to maybe tie into this is this value add or value pricing discussion. Now, the, the part of tax planning versus preparation, starting there, 
I'm amazed so often as I have conversations with tax preparers, how often they fail to do tax planning. And as you were describing, just do the filing. They're just doing the preparation. They're doing that minimal requirement of filing it for the the client and never bothering to go back and do planning and save them the money as you were describing. And there's technically a lot of money to be made as tax preparers in that space if we just chose to do the planning for our clients and save them, as you were pointing out, an average of 20 plus thousand dollars per filing. So Help me understand mm-hmm. how you would describe the difference between tax planning and preparation. Yeah, that's a really important distinction, right? Um, because here's the thing, you know, at that time, I, I really wondered why someone would want to wait two years to meet with mm-hmm. me, knowing that that would wait would cost them $50,000. Yeah. Was it simply because traditional accountants just didn't know how to do this work? And and so it really hit me that I didn't actually learn advanced tax reduction strategies in college or as part of my minimum CPA license training. Correct. These types of breaks are found in court cases, which are taught in law school. And, and most tax accountants don't got, go to law school. And so we um, you know, go about our lives and we start our tax practices doing a fine job. We learn how to do the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Right. But we aren't necessarily taught that there's a lot more that can be done. But lawyers know this. But the problem is most lawyers don't become tax professionals. Mm -hmm. So people were willing to wait two years to meet with me and continue to pay taxes that they didn't need to because they didn't feel like they could get this type of planning anywhere else. And, um, you know, that that sort of makes sense because the government doesn't actually care if you overpay. <laughs> so they don't require these types of skills to become licensed. Yeah, they're eager to audit and actually collect what's owed, but they're not so eager to audit and give back per se. So I, I agree with you there. Now, mm-hmm. what you're describing here is, I think, very exciting because when it comes to tax planning, there's a lot of people that actually niche in the tax space just in these areas alone. You've got R&D tax credits, you've got cat cost segregations, you've got people that may be involved, may be involved in um, conservation easement type uh, practices. There's a lot of strategies that can be implemented that are legal to limit the tax liability that a business owner may face at the personal level and at the business level. And I, I agree with you. There's a lot of excitement that can be done when you're playing those strategies of what can we do to help the client minimize that tax liability And that brings us to that value add or value pricing component. Mm -hmm. When you're saving a client $25,000, it's maybe not just enough to charge for the forms that you're filing, but rather with the strategy and the time being put in to identify these things and position things so that they're eligible for these cost savings, all of a sudden you're able to maybe ask for five or $10,000 and so forth for that same filing that you may be doing that could have been priced differently. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think this goes back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago. And that is, you know, what is this distinction between planning and preparation? And so, in fact, I even suggest that you do the planning engagement as a completely separate engagement. Mm-hmm. So it's not about filing forms at all. Yeah, it's, It is the analysis. And, and the biggest distinction there is that you're, instead of recording history, which is what we're classically trained to do. Yes. Instead, we're thinking proactively and looking at what changes can be made in real time so that we can take the tax code and use every advantage of every deduction, loophole, credit, and break. And, and that really is this separate engagement. And I, I think it does lend itself particularly well to value pricing because the key question with value pricing is what is the value created Mm -hmm. in this engagement? Mm -hmm. And and that's really tough to define when we have these abstract projects that we work on. You know, what, for example, is the value of a tax return? Whereas with a tax planning engagement, it's pretty simple. If I put 25 grand in somebody's pocket, I know I'm worth 25 grand to them. Now, Will they be willing to pay me 25 grand to do the work? Probably not, because that doesn't really seem like a good deal. But it becomes a lot easier than for me to give context to my premium fee when they know exactly what they're going to get out of that 
uh, working project together. You know, one of the things that I've used numerous times to illustrate this point of value pricing that I'm sure those who are familiar with value pricing understand or perhaps even heard it before, and it's the idea of what the person is paying for isn't the time or the process that you're doing. It's for the experience and the knowledge that you've over the years acquired to help them take advantage of these various opportunities that they're paying for. And so just to use a a trade example, when the plumber comes over and you've got an issue that's going on in your home and they happen to spend fewer than five, 10 minutes identifying the problem, tightening a screw and maybe making an adjustment and then gives you an invoice for those 15 minutes that's perhaps a minimum service fee of $100, you might, you know, watching as the consumer be frustrated. Why am I paying you $100? I literally watched you. You spent five minutes assessing what's going on. You tightened a few screws. You did this little thing and you're charging me $100. And they put on the invoice, great. I'm going to put down that I, I'm charging you $10 for my time, but I'm going to charge you $80 or $90 for knowing what to do to fix the situation. And that's the essence of value pricing. It's recognizing that with our years of experience and our time each and every year, updating ourselves as to the various tax law changes, that expertise is giving them, in your example, the $25,000. And so for us to charge 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 for that fee makes sense. And that's the essence of the value pricing. Uh, Is there anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, I think that it's this, what you've kind of summed so nicely is it's the big difference between getting paid to do something mm-hmm. versus, versus getting paid to think. Yeah. And when we're using value pricing, it's much easier in this realm to get pay, paid to think because they want our strategies. They want the result of what those strategies bring. Mm-hmm. And so time is really irrelevant. Yeah. Again, yeah. going back to your example, um, I actually don't question the plumber because if I'm up to my ankles in sewage because the <laughs> toilet's overflowing, I really don't care as long as he can get his stuff and, and get out of here, right? And, and that's the difference um, in our world between paying for results ver- versus paying, especially for time. The time sort yeah. of doesn't make a difference if you can get the results. The same reason we all pay over a thousand bucks for a smartphone because that we're just about the phone, there's way cheaper ways to get a phone Amen. in your life. Amen. But the smartphone can do so many more things for you. And so suddenly the price doesn't really become much of a factor anymore. Exactly. Now, I'm going to do one more thing with this, and I'd like your thoughts on this. Uh, just to summarize a conversation that I traditionally have with tax preparers is I try to distinguish between tax planning and preparation is I illustrate what a relationship with a client could look like just to kind of tease into them mm-hmm what planning could consist of. And I explained that during Mm -hmm. the tax season, they're obviously going to do what's needed to file the tax return. And at that time, they're busy during the tax season filing those returns. I admit that. The the idea of setting aside time for something else is a little counterintuitive because that's where they're making their money. But what I do say Mm -hmm. is that as you're processing the returns, if you could flag those that you've noticed missed opportunities from the previous tax year that they failed to take advantage of, and you flag those so that once the tax season is en- has ended, you're able to then go back and in the second, third quarter, meet with those clients and pull them in and take the time to share with them, these are some of the missed opportunities that you failed to take advantage of last year. The law still exists as it currently does. We should implement these strategies today in your business so that you don't go another year missing this opportunity. And then you've had that tax planning opportunity that you identified during the tax season that stood out to you, but you waited until the season was over to now address. They're impressed that you're actually taking care of them. They're obviously appreciative of this tax advice and planning that's going to save them money. And then you come back again in the third, fourth quarter, and you do another tax planning meeting to say, here are some of the recent tax laws. Here are some of the things that have taken place that might be new. By the way, did you do what we discussed? And lastly, what are your plans moving forward that maybe we could implement and take advantage of strategies today that could actually help with your tax situation and lower your tax liability before the year ends leading up to the next tax season? And those very minimal efforts in that second and third and fourth quarter discussions can really yield some phenomenal tax savings. And that's simply because of the fact that as a tax preparer, you stopped just being in this myopic approach of I'm doing tax preparation. 
and you started to work with your clients and actually give tax planning advice. And honestly, I think most tax preparers have insights, suggestions, things that they can point out to their clients if we just bothered to take the time to meet with them and share that insight. What would you add to that? Yeah, I think you've hit it is that the key component there is that we really need that information, right? We need that information more in real time because there's only so much we can do after the fact. And most of the time with traditional accounting practices, we are not made aware of what transactions have occurred until the year's over. And so it doesn't really matter how great you are um, with preparing that financial statement or that tax return. If you didn't know that they were selling a rental property and getting a capital gain, or you didn't know that they were buying a new business, or you didn't know that they had a particular expense, but not a legal way to write it off, there's just nothing you can do about it. And so we have to find a way to change the direction of how we're working with people. And that requires training the client as well as the accountant, because if you're sitting waiting around for a client to contact you and say, hey, by the way, I'm doing this, you're going to be sitting a long time. They don't know what's important to let us know. And and besides, they don't want to get a bill when they do Mm -hmm. it. And so it's really important that you develop a process that allows you to force people to work with you in that way. And this won't be a good fit for everybody. But when you do, now you're armed with the information that you need so that you can do the best that you can in, in terms of positioning yourself to take a, uh, advantage of those breaks. You know, honestly, I think for a lot of business owners, if we as tax preparers play our cards right, we can literally be a hero for these people because they work so hard to earn what they get they do so much on a day-to-day basis to run their businesses. And if we could just come in and help them see what legally is within their right to save the money that they've worked so hard to get, we become the hero. And I think if we can just get out of our own way and get into helping them, they'll be so grateful for that. And at the same time, refer to us so many others that we could be working with with that same uh, idea. Um, Would you mind if I change the topic on, on us? All right. So, Dominic, here's the next thing. I know we were speaking of this earlier, so I want to bring it up now. I define in an accounting firm three core businesses. I refer to them as the accounting and bookkeeping, basically everything that's being done to prepare the financial reports, everything leading up to, let's say, the needed numbers to to prepare and, and file the tax return. So you've got the accounting and bookkeeping, the tax planning and preparation, but there's this third element that's very, very much, I think, missed, but hugely uh, of interest, and it's the CFO advisory space. And it's after working for so many years, getting a lot of experience, having a little bit more confidence in our skill sets, we have an opportunity as accounting professionals to go into that third realm and honestly make bigger differences for our clients, diving deeper into that client relationship, and most importantly, get paid so much more. So the first question I have for you is, how does someone make a transition from being a tax professional to actually offering advisory services in your mind? That's a great question. And and again, it takes some forethought ahead of time. Um, You know, when people approach us for something else, they've got that on the brain. Hmm. So if I'm coming in saying, hey, I need my financial statements updated, I need my books brought up to date, and I need a financial statement for the bank, it's not the appropriate time to suggest advisory services because that's not what they need at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so your suggestion earlier of being able to approach somebody with specifics in mind. So that's helpful too, because you have to remember our, our clients rely on us for our expertise. They don't know what they don't know. And they're relying on us to tell them right? And so they don't automatically understand what it means when we say, hey, we can do strategic planning and it's going to help your business do better. What does that mean, do better? Can we get much more specific? And so if we can approach them with very specific results, um, I'll give you an example. This, This goes back to planning, which is in the advisory space, but Um, I did some number crunching and just saving 10% on business taxes allows a business to grow 21,000% faster. Wow. So it doesn't really seem fair 
that bigger companies are able to use their extra tax money to build their businesses much more quickly than everyone else. But if I can bring that information to my clients to say, hey, you know, your business has really gotten to the point now where strategic planning can really help you. It's not just about the financial statements that we produce for the bank, for example, but it's about what information can we get from those statements? What does it mean? What decisions and what actions can we take as a result of understanding those better and not putting that burden on the taxpayer or the client to say, well, I don't know what these mean. It's gobbledygook. (laughs) But to say, let me give you some examples, specific examples of this and how this could change things for you. And so when we're able to approach it in that way, now, it requires doing a little bit of work up front, Mm -hmm. right? So that you can crunch some numbers, create an estimate, do something so that you can speak specifically to the results. But when you can actually be specific about what's in it for the other person, Now, suddenly you go from, again, selling your time to selling your ideas, to selling uh, your thoughts, to being paid to think. And that makes a big difference in making that transition. You know, one of the things that I've found that's helpful in addressing this whole concept of advisory services is just saying that as accounting professionals, we just need a genuine curiosity about our clients. If we're just curious mm-hmm. about their business, how they make money, what it is they're doing to grow the business, that curiosity causes us to ask the appropriate questions and what we're bringing to the table that the business owner can't see because they're so consumed by the day-to-day operations of their business, the human resource issues, the drama that may be going on in the company, the supply chain issues that they may be face- facing, all these types of things that they deal with on a day-to-day basis we have perspective that allows us to come in and ask maybe some things that they're not considering thinking about. And it causes them to see their business in a new light. And they're grateful for that Mm -hmm. insight. And they're going to be willing to pay us if we make that as part of the additional engagement we're doing with them. Now, here's a challenge or a question, though. Uh, What's a pitfall that someone may face when choosing to begin offering advisory services and being successful in that space? That's a great question. I I think, um, again, it's sort of making that transition from being reactive, which is what most of us are classically trained to do, to instead being proactive. And so number one, you cannot afford to wait for someone to approach you. You have to do the approaching. That's being proactive, right? Most of us in the profession We do a great job. The phone rings, we get an email, somebody has a problem and we get to work and we make it happen. But again, um, we have to be the ones approaching. And so you have to then ask yourself, what prevents me from doing that? For most of us, I would say it's time. We lack the sufficient time that we need to be able to do anything extra in the business. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do to create the time? Does it mean maybe shedding some of those projects that aren't as profitable for you? Does it mean maybe digging deep for a little while so that you can get this off the ground, this advisory service line off the ground and and maybe putting in a little extra for a while? But you've got to find a way to give yourself the space and time so that you can make that transition. Because again, we all know how fast time goes by and and before you know it, we blink and it's a year from now and we're still in the same place. Nothing will change unless you actually create the change that you're looking for. And and so I think that's a big pitfall. The other one is um, using pricing versus billing. Mm, Okay. You know, in our industry, uh, the the traditional model is that we don't often know the scope of the work that we're doing. And we run into that problem of scope creep all the time where maybe we've said, hey, I think this is going to be five or seven hundred dollars to do. We get in. It's much more messy than we thought. We're lacking the info we need. There's mistakes that need correcting. And we come out at the end and now it's a six thousand dollar project. 
And I think um, if you're listening to this today and you can relate to this idea of then going back to the client and saying, hmm, you know, it's not 700, it's really 6,000, you have probably been on the receiving end of the ire of the business owner (laughs) because they don't want to have to do that. And they weren't really given a choice in the matter. Nevertheless, we still have that issue of what am I getting myself into? What is the scope of what I'm going to be doing? And so when you bill after the fact, we call that billing, right? You do the work and you bill and you really hope like heck that you're going to get paid for that. And a lot of times you don't make the full amount. That's what we call realization, right? You may have to mark it down. You may have to negotiate it with the business owner. Um, You may not be able to collect it at all because they go, tough, I'm not paying you. Um, and, and so that's a very difficult position to be in, especially when we're looking to transition into value pricing and advisory type services, because we're talking big dollars here. Yeah. And so uh, that can be shocking to the business owner. If I'm normally charging 1500 or 2,500 bucks for a business tax return, and suddenly now I give them a bill for $25,000, far too easy for them to go, nah, that's okay. I don't need it. And you've already done the work. You're out. So you have to get comfortable pricing on the front end. And that means investing some time, investing a little work, knowing that it's possible they'll say no and they're not interested and being okay with that. But so that you can get a much more specific idea of what results you can create, and what it's going to take for you to create those results so that you can give a very clear idea to the business owner. Here's what you can get and here's how much it can cost. And that way they're making an educated financial decision about whether they want to move forward or not. And that way you get paid before you ever begin any work. You don't have realization anymore. Your realization is 100%. Why? Because the people who don't want to do it that way, you don't work with. And those who do, you're happily collecting up front uh, in advance before any work begins. So what I liked about what you were sharing there is actually quite a few things. The first part is the intentional nature of what you're describing. It's basically saying to the accounting professional, the tax professional, look, in order to offer these types of advisory services, we've got to be intentional and deliberate. We've got to first take a moment and step out of our business, work on it and come up with the offering and what is it that we're going to be doing for our clients. And in that process, we're going to address how we're going to market it, how we're going to sell it, how we're going to price it. But then as you were individually approaching a client and offering this advisory services, you needed to be able to position it, package it so that they see its value, how it's going to be beneficial to them. So that like you were describing the difference between invoicing and billing, we're able to uh, manage expectations and get them to agree Mm -hmm. to a certain payout for that service you're about ready to perform and deliver. So it was very deliberate what we're we're talking about here. It's it's taking us as a tax professional and saying, let's be a little bit more intentional about how we're running our business, move into that advisory space with a very specific offering, a particular pricing package, a solution or or deliverable that the client can expect. And then at the end, we're going to get paid what we're due simply because of the fact that we set that up so cleanly with the client that we were able to manage that expectation. How how does that sound? Yeah, absolutely. That's really key there. And yet, how, how few of us actually put in that effort in advance. Most of us are stretched so thin that we're going from appointment to appointment or project to project. Mm -hmm. And we don't have, we don't afford ourselves really the time to really even identify what do I want to get out of this business? And as a result of that, we, we kind of turn control of our business over to someone else. Usually the someone else is our customers, right? (laughs) They control, you know, our work processes, when we're going to work, when it needs to be done, how much they want to pay. And that's not a smart way to run a business, yet so many of us uh, find ourselves in that space. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to what you just shared here, and I'm going to be very blunt. I think a lot of people get into this accounting space offering quality services. They they are doing well for their clients, 
But so often it's as a solo entrepreneur, what I refer to as an account entrepreneur. We're in the accounting space offering accounting services and we're entrepreneurial in the sense that we run our business. But at the end of the day, when we're in that solo mindset, it's basically a job. We just opened a business and we hired ourselves and granted we're paid well for the work that we're doing and we can make a great income and make you know a difference with the clients that we have. But what you're describing is a business and it's hiring people so that we can start delegating some of the other tasks to free us up to perhaps be that very key influential person with our clients getting paid the top dollar for not filing returns, but actually working with them as that advisor. And it's paying somebody else to be the tax preparer. We're now the advisor and the tax specialist. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And and I think it's strategic and smart, particularly in this age where we are facing such advancements with technology, Mm -hmm. where there's lots of jobs in the accounting profession that are soon to be obsolete. And we've already seen it with lots of um, improvements in terms of data exporting and character recognition, where you can import tax forms and have it automatically populate. We've seen um, bookkeeping services where you just scan all your documents in and miraculously a financial statement appears. And so to protect yourselves, uh, we have to really understand, again, why would somebody want to work with us if what we do is replaceable and or replaceable with technology, with a robot, (laughs) essentially. And so, uh, you know, really considering that and where you're going to be in the future versus being so nearsighted uh, when it comes to work. A lot of us are in, uh, in such survival mode. You know, how do I get from one deadline to the next? Or how do I cover my overhead next month? Or how do I just um, get this over with so I don't have to deal with this client anymore? Um, But it is, it's taking that step out so that you can work above the business and and see uh, what's happening so that you can kind of do what you're supposed to be doing for your clients. You do it for yourself, right? Or what a lot of our clients ask us to do. Uh, We want to do that for ourselves as well. You know, for years, I was attending accounting conferences, and again and again, people would say just flippantly, we need to offer more value. We need to become more advisors in our business. Uh, we need to do more value pricing. They, they would use these terms as if everyone understood what that meant and how to do it. And over the years, what I've found is a lot of people get frustrated. And you were describing a moment ago a lot of these technological advances that have simplified the process of accounting and automated it in a lot of regards. And in the accounting profession, there was resistance and hesitation to embrace that. But in all honesty, that actually frees up our time to do more of this higher end service work and really get paid better and more for the the skills and experiences that we have. So I, I like your forward thinking on this. Um, so here's a question. What is the biggest benefit that uh, an accounting professional can experience making this transition to include advisory services with the bookkeeping, accounting, and tax planning and preparation services that they may already be offering? If I had to sum it up, I'd I'd say one word, and that's uh, control. It puts control over your business back into your hands. See, that's the thing. When you're offering something that people really want, um, they have to play by your rules to get it. They have to pay the prices that you want to get paid to get it. They have to um, follow your procedures Mm -hmm. to get it. And I'm not trying to say this in a a nasty way, like you're running a dictatorship here, but, you know, isn't that why you started a business to begin with? Most of the accounting businesses out there are not set up as a 501c business. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes they act like one, though. True. Yes, exactly. And and in fact, um, you know, let's talk about that for just a moment and, and then I'll, I'll go back to your question. But, you know, a lot of us got into this profession because we love helping people. Mm-hmm. But what good is that if you can't afford to do it? Yes. You know, you become bitter and resentful and you're grinding your teeth trying to get something out the door at a free or low cost because at one time you liked to help people, but you really can't afford to do it. And so what I would say to that is that when you can run a business 
focusing on higher value engagements and getting paid value pricing premium fees, that actually makes it much more feasible for you to do those heart cases. You know, the cases where you just really enjoy the person, the cases where you feel for somebody because they're really going through it and you want to give them a break, but you have to be able to afford to do it, right? And it doesn't come at the expense of yourself or your own family. And and so uh, making that transition makes that much more likely that you can pull that off. Yeah. Well, here's one of the things that I would throw into this is your comment about the the uh, caring, the willingness to kind of make a difference and, and, and help out. If you're not being successful and profitable in running your own business, you start to resent the clients that you have. You start to get frustrated with the work that you're doing because you're not benefiting from it. And it's a drudgery. I, I really want to say that there's no harm in being profitable. There's no harm in being successful. There's no harm in making money at what you do because darn it, you're a good professional. And so I I want to, for anyone listening, say that if you're not actually getting paid what you're worth, you need to really reassess two things. The value that you're providing to your clients, can you more clearly define how they're benefiting from the work that you're doing? And if you can articulate that better, they're going to see the worth in what it is you do. And more importantly, then address the pricing that you're charging for the services that you're offering and be willing to ask for more. You, You deserve it. And there's no reason why you should be destitute and limping along because you do offer a very valuable service, especially when you consider those three core things that I was describing earlier. If you're literally doing the bookkeeping and accounting, the tax planning and preparation and the advisory, as we've been discussing, those are hugely profitable services to be providing. And if you're doing them effectively, your clients will pay for it because they're benefiting far more than what you're doing for them. Um, So... uh, Dominique, let me kind of switch gears on this. Um, Mm -hmm. You work with a lot of tax professionals. You're helping them out in their business. What's one of the things that you have found has held someone back from really embracing what we're discussing today and moving in that direction? What what sometimes holds them back from that opportunity? Uh, There's two things that come to mind, Roger, Uh uh, on, on that question, how to answer that question. Uh, the first is, you know, the the lack of belief that it's possible. Mm-hmm. You were just describing, you know, this, maybe this fear of earning more. I, I think yeah. it comes down to fear. Or maybe it's a feeling of undeserving that, you know, I'm bad if I earn too much money or I don't deserve to earn much more money. Yeah. Um, and that's really a mindset, right? It's really believing in yourself and believing that you are worth it. And, and here's what happens, what I see happens in our industry a lot is we get pretty beat up, you know, especially the last few years with the pandemic, there've been a lot of demands. And in fact, I'll suggest that the accounting profession has been carrying this country on its shoulders Amen. for the last couple of years. Yeah. If you think about how all the stimulus was delivered. It was through the accounting professionals that we were able to pull that off. People needed financials. People needed to know their payroll so that they could qualify for Mm -hmm. PPP and for EIDL and for tax credits that were made available, for advanced child tax credits, for stimulus payments for families. Um, We're being expected to do more and more and more. And the stress of that really gets to you. And the pressure that we may feel because we may be dealing with hundreds of clients at a time just trying to make ends meet. And that's a lot. And it can really take its toll on your esteem. I I see that every day. You start to believe maybe what you're hearing or you start to feel embarrassed or ashamed about wanting to just get compensated for the work that you do. And so you really have to believe first and foremost that this is possible for you. And so I'd encourage you just to look around and and talk to people who are doing it in this way because there's lots and lots of people who have completely turned their lives around by making this shift in their business. And, And you can do it too. What I like about this model is that we need to be reminded sometimes of the value we do provide. It's easy for us to forget and we take it for granted 
You know, I, I started this discussion saying I've been balancing my parents' checkbook since I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. We take it for granted what comes easier to us than for most people. And so when we communicate our value to our clients, it also is communicating our value to ourselves. And that's a really key component in this. You can't charge more than you feel you deserve, or more than you believe you're worth. So you have to believe it first. And so if you don't already believe that or you have trouble believing that, I would just encourage you to talk to your peers, talk to people in the industry that are actually doing this so that you can borrow their confidence for a little while mm -hmm. to make this happen. And then the second obstacle I talked about earlier a little bit, and that is this idea of reactive versus proactive. And it's a little bit like turning the ship. You know, when you think about a cruise ship, those things are humongous or aircraft carriers. These things are huge machines on the water. And I don't know if you've ever been boating before, Roger, but there's no brake <laughs> on a boat. You're right. There, <laughs> there are not. So to actually turn directions on those huge boats that are on the water takes a tremendous amount of effort and it takes a tremendous amount of intention to do it. And so you have to really then ask yourself, what is it going to take for me to have the time and the space that I need to be able to look at this in a different way and take the time to reach out to my clients or even prospective clients so that I can make a difference for them and, and work together on advisory type services? Thank you so much for those two uh, insights, perspectives, because I do feel that just at an individual level, there are a lot of people that do struggle with that confidence, with that ability to see that they are actually worth what they uh, see their peers perhaps making or feel or hear that they're supposed to be earning, but they're not. So I appreciate you addressing it. Uh, I'm going to switch gears on this and uh, take us down another uh, real quick path and ask, with your experience, with your successes, have you worked with a coach or a mentor before? Oh, yes. I've had lots of coaches and mentors throughout different times or seasons in my life, as I like to call Good. it. And, you know, that extends beyond um, just business. You know, I've been blessed to have many uh, personal uh, mentors or coaches, as I like to see them. Yeah. And, and, I, you know, I can't take credit for everything that I've achieved without mentioning uh, that support and that uh, feedback that's so essential. So please then share with me, what is one of the things that you learned from one of your mentors or coaches and how it was so helpful to you in your business? I think it extends back to what I was just talking about a few moments ago, and that is you know, the, uh, the esteem and the confidence in your own worth and your value. I had the pleasure of working with um, a really tremendous business coach uh, about five, six years ago. And we were talking about big picture things, you know, way off in the distance things. And I said, okay, you know, here's my plans. Here's my idea. And I thought I had it all figured out. And this person looked at me and said, you're thinking too small you're thinking way too small. And I was a little put off, honestly, by that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, what, you think I can do much more, <laughs> you know, because that's, that's pretty pushing it, you know, in my opinion. And this person really challenged me to think bigger. And it's not always that bigger is better. But what I have found is that I tend to overestimate what I can do in the short term, but I also underestimate what I can do in the long term. Uh -huh. And uh, and that was a really valuable lesson that I learned uh, from this particular coach. And you know what? It's funny because I think thinking smaller puts a limit on what you accomplish. You know, you sort of, you're just uh, trying to reach this one line. But when you make that line much further... Uh, you can go further than you ever thought possible. And and again, it doesn't have to be just talking about dollars and cents or the size of your business or anything of that sort, but it could just be challenging yourself to take on something that you've never done before 
It's that idea of playing bigger, bigger than you thought, bigger than the limits you've, we've, we all place on ourselves from time to time and what we think is possible. And, uh, and so I will always be uh, grateful for that lesson. You know, thank you for sharing that. I, I can relate. I think sometimes I limit myself and I've always appreciated the challenges that I've received from others to do more, try more, dream bigger, and it's paid off. It really truly has. Even if I shoot for the the uh, stars and get the moon type of a thing, uh, I'm coming out way ahead. So I uh, very, very much appreciate that insight. Um, the other question I wanted to ask is regarding San Diego. I've been there twice already this year. I've been there a number of times in the past. What is a hidden gem in San Diego that I should be aware of that when I'm back in town, I should take advantage of? Oh man, if I tell you, it wouldn't be hidden anymore. That's the whole idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there's hidden gems of lots of kinds, you know, whether it's having fun and being physical and outside. San Diego is a beautiful place year round to really be outside and enjoy the fresh air and the sun. And even when it's cloudy, it's still really beautiful. And, uh, and so there's a, a place I like to go. Uh, it's, it's north of downtown San Diego in uh, real close to La Jolla. It's an area called Torrey Pines. You've probably heard mm -hmm. of it, but they have this little glider port there. And I love to just take a blanket, take a little snack, something to eat, a little sandwich, favorite beverage, and just sit out there and watch the hang gliders come oh. in and to enjoy the sunset, breathe in that ocean air and it's just, it, I can't help but just feel so grateful every time I do it uh, that I'm blessed to live in such a beautiful location. And there's beauty everywhere. Yeah. I, I haven't visited a place yet on this globe that I haven't been able to appreciate a, a thing of beauty like that. So whether it's as grand as sitting on a cliff overlooking the Pacific or it's just a, a tree that you love and is majestic, you know, getting out there is very grounding and it just kind of reminds us of our place in this universe. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very small compared to the universe at large. And I think that's helpful to keep in mind. I love that perspective. You know, I, I like you, I've traveled quite a bit. I continue to travel quite a bit. And in all of my travels, I'm always in awe of the natural beauty that exists everywhere I go. So it's it's uh, it's very humbling, so I love it. But I do love coming home. I am quite quite fond of where I live. I'm in Utah, so uh, a lot to be said for here, but enjoy the travels I have. I did realize there's one other thing I forgot. I know that our time is pretty much past, and I apologize for going long, but I have to bring this up. My wife and I, we have a guilty pleasure, and that guilty pleasure happens to be a show called Married at First Sight. Are you familiar with that at all? I'm familiar with the concept. I can't say I've seen the show yet. Well, though. the season that's coming up happens to be taking place there in San Diego. So for what it's worth, ah. it's going to be there. Obviously, as shows are done, it's probably all wrapped up and finished and they're in the editing process at this point. But the fact is, is the season is coming out and it is San Diego. So for the listeners of the show today, there's a, a transparency. Uh, I find uh, find the show very fascinating on a lot of levels and uh, enjoy it quite a bit. And coincidentally, it happens to be in San Diego this next season. So anyways, uh, with that being said, here's what I'd like to do, Dominique. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up our conversation by sharing some summary uh, thoughts that I've had from this and come back to you for a closing thought as we wrap this up. But real quickly, as a mention of uh, things to take advantage, go to the episode description. And in there, I'm going to be putting some information regarding the American Institute of Certified Tax Planners that you can actually take advantage of learning more about that, as well as what it is you can do as a professional tax preparer to, if you're not already offering these quality services, taking and focusing on those three core services that you can be providing as an accounting professional. Obviously, the accounting and bookkeeping, of course, the tax planning and preparation, and as well, the advisory, the CFO and advisory services that we've been discussing today. Go there to the episode description to learn more how you can actually now apply these principles in your business, increase the value that you're offering to the clients you serve, and literally get paid what you're worth. In fact, becoming for your clients that profit and growth expert that you should be for them. Now, with that as a summary of our conversation, I love the discussion. Obviously, Dominique, starting at a young age, doing not only the balancing the check, but the, but the tax return as a 15-year-old, that's pretty impressive. And to find joy in that and see that it's taken her this far in the career to where she's now doing so much in the tax space, helping tax professionals realize their full potential as tax professionals servicing their clients is amazing. 
I love the concept where she was explaining the difference between invoicing and billing. I think that was a very important thing to understand. And then this whole idea of getting beyond just tax preparation, but literally doing tax planning for our clients and finding those opportunities to save the clients. We're working with those $25,000 nuggets and literally getting, getting involved in more of the advisory and value pricing opportunities that allow us to actually earn more for the services we're providing. Lots of great nuggets in there that I'm hoping that all of you as listeners were able to hear and take note of. The other thing that I'd like to point out is just her enthusiasm. She's got a contagious energy about her that literally is very helpful as we as accounting professionals need that same passion for the work that we do. And I appreciate her bringing that to the show today. Uh, The last thing, it was fun to talk about San Diego. I've been there, as I mentioned, twice this year already. I've got some friends that are there. I've been there typically about once a year, have lots that I enjoy doing there in the area. And honestly, it's just a great place to go. So thank you for that little insight. I have not been there to see the gliders and enjoy the sunset. So I've got something to put on my bucket list. So with all that being said, Dominique, what do you have as a closing thought today? Oh, my closing thought is to focus on yourself for once. Think about what you're really trying to achieve because you really can't help anyone else before you help yourself. And uh, this is a great space to be in. Uh, I still love accounting. I love tax. And um, I want to see more people get involved uh, in this industry. And, And it is possible to build a business that will really serve you and work for you if you've got intention and purpose behind it. So if you can go back to the drawing board and start with that, it'll really open up new possibilities both for you and your clients. You'll be able to earn premium fees, breathe new life into your existing book of business, and reinforce that value both to yourself and to those that you serve. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. And as listeners, again, go to the episode description for additional insights of things that you can take advantage of hearing this episode. I encourage you to subscribe if you haven't already to this ep- to this podcast. We have each and every week experts coming on the show to share insights as to how we can, in fact, become the premier accounting firm in our areas. And with that being said, I invite you to, if you would like to apply these principles in your business or if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us at universalaccountingschool.com or give us a phone call at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, accounting success is universal. Take care and have a great day out there.